Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, any other groups, communication, safety, child care? For child care, we didn't get to next steps, but based on um, what was shared, um, we need more information on the type of model, what's going to look like for us to do next steps for child care. Yeah, and I think that's where maybe the county framework's a little bit light is on the, the overlap or coordination between the school program and after school programs. Um, although, yeah, anyway, so that's something for us to, to keep an eye on. Um, so let's see, any other comments from folks in terms of suggestions for going forward? I think from the safety and other members of the, of the breakout group can uh, correct me if I'm off, but I think the Thing that I was hearing more than anything was the importance of having very clear procedures that can be operational okay. um, that tell staff, students, parents what to do under in, in very specific circumstances um, or to have very specific procedures for for hand washing and and, and other aspects of hygiene uh, but like by way of example just you know if a kid does uh, have 100.4 temperature, then what? Where does that student go? How is communication being made with, with parents? How are we protecting other students and staff members from possible transmission from that student, et cetera? Um, at this point, I'd like to open it up to the entire committee. Uh, please use the raise hand feature and maybe Pam, you could facilitate, keep an eye on that participant list and um, uh, Help us with the um, uh, help us with the comments. Does everyone see the raise hand? Uh, I think it's. Is it under the? Is it? Yeah, when you I need to, to click to, participants and then you'll see a raise hand button in the participants window. So at the bottom of the participants window, there's a, if you're on like a PC or Mac, there's a, the three little dots. If you click that, it'll give you an option to raise hand. Gotcha. We, we got a question <laughs> from Maybe Brian Joe. You need to raise their hand and it's not oh. even a feature that you can, that you, <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey, so uh, Craig, I think that's a, I, you raised a great question that um, I don't think I quite understand is, is if there is a, 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 maybe a lot of parents don't understand is, if somebody is infected somehow in the classroom, what is the CDC guideline or what, what what's going to happen to the rest of the 12 other, 12 to 13 other people in that classroom, um, you know, that, that may, uh, caused me to think of a, of a different model or, uh, or consider a different model uh, than what I was considering. Because I didn't necessarily think about, hey, if somebody does get infected and uh, they trace it back to a classroom, uh, what happens to the other 13 kids? What happens to the other rest of the school? Um, and I think that's a, that becomes a major concern. Um, I've been very following shelter in place very closely. So um, you know, in terms of not allowing my kids to venture out too far, and I think you know, uh, understanding what the uh, what the CDC plans or what is the what does the county guidelines say when that happens, if that happens, what's going to happen to the rest of the uh, other kids in that classroom? And without jumping into the answer there, I mean, I think that uh, at minimum that cohort stays home, um, and potentially uh, you could even have the entire school go to distance learning. Um, for a day or two as you did cleaning and an assessment of the, the scale of the issue. Um, but that's something uh, for the safety committee to make sure we're really clear on. Um, any other comments, uh, Pam? Uh, yes, uh, Gloria Wu has a question. So I just want to, I was in the safety group, you know, because, you know, families with special needs are particularly concerned about safety. And I just want to, suggest that we either have group meetings among special day class teachers and the parents or individually, you know, for special day class teachers to reach out to the families 
and really plan specifically about the reopening plans. Uh, I know that a lot of families are trying to decide if they should return to school in the fall and they have a lot of questions about how you know what kind of safety protocol is going to be in place for the special day classes and again these are students who have very limited ability to comply with safety procedures yet needs a lot of hands-on support and i would really you know urge that we have such meetings so that everyone is as prepared as possible when school re reopens okay so tammy laura chingpei can we note that any other comments, Pam? Uh, Terry Delgadillo. Hi. Some of our concern in the safety committee was about parents being on board as far as sending ill students to school, as far as if a student does fall ill during school, where do they go? Our nurses station you can't even be six feet apart in our little nurse's station. So the stations would have to be different. And as far as the parents being on board, um, when we had whooping cough go through, we had a parent that we called and explained that, you know, this child probably had whooping cough and he said, well, what do you want me to do, pick him up? <laughs> yes. And he was very reluctant to do so. And when you think about these, these students, they're sick. I understand the parent wants to go to work or is at work and doesn't want to just come over or the, distant, the distance of the work is too far for the student to just pop on over, or sorry, the parent to pick up, pick up the student. It's a very, um, there's so many different scenarios that I've seen in the front office. So, and, and some parents just think, ah, they'll be fine. Uh, thanks, Terry. Um, I think, uh, yeah, we uh, do have that guidance from the county that there needs to be a uh, dedicated space for, uh, uh, you know, people with symptoms, or, or, or health concerns. And that's gonna have to be uh, different than what we have now. Um, Pam, additional comments? Ann Strelo. I'm, so you mentioned that you were planning to offer kind of a remote op option for families that wanted that um, option. And it looked like according to the data that Ching Pei presented that that is about 20% of families are interested in a remote learning option. So if I like just kind of do the brain math on that, if, if you take that 20% of families out of the mix, you've lowered our class sizes on average to about 20 to 24 kids per class. I, don't, I didn't hear um, Craig speak to the facilities thing. I guess I missed that. Um, do we have room in our classes for 20 to 24 students? Because in my mind, Having our kids in a consistent cohort of 20 to 24 students every day is better than my child being with 15 kids one day and then going into child care with 15 different kids another day and then potentially going to an after school camp with a different set of 15 kids. You've then actually mixed hundreds of children at that point. And I think that remaining with that 20 cohort would then be a better option. I, I don't know if that is a possibility, if we are able to ensure that that 20% is being homeschooled or not. Yeah, um, that, uh, and we would be able to have um, the exact same number of classrooms only if we didn't pull any teachers offline to teach the distance learning program, right? So we do lose some classrooms that way. Um, you know, right now, if uh, most of our classrooms are 960 square feet, and if you divide that by 36 square feet per student, right, if each kid gets their own six foot square, you could have 26 students in the classroom with no teacher and no cabinets and no furniture whatsoever. Um, and so I think we're pretty close when we get to something like 18 students 
might be something like the max. So that would be a best, best, best case scenario where we could provide an everyday program to the people who want it and a stay at home program for the people who want it. Um, I agree, that would be um, outstanding. I guess my, right now my challenge is um, if we do pull the, if we take the 20% and move them to online, um, if I take 20% of my staff and have them be distance learning teachers, then I um, still need uh, classes of 25 and 30 for all the in-person people. So your model um, would require, I think, the distance learning folks to take considerably more than a, a standard class size. Um, and is that kind of what you're thinking is, is for them to be able to a bigger group or who knows? No, I mean, I guess I was just, like thinking about it from just the perspective of just numbers, um, not necessarily in terms of staffing sizes or, I mean, do we have any idea if there's gonna be families that may actually pull their kids out and put them in alternative um, programs at all? Is there any information that we've collected on, on that from families? Yeah, the, I don't have a good sense of folks uh, leaving the system entirely, but right now we just have that data. Um, but yeah, I, I agree. That would that would be um, ideal. Pam, any more hands up? There are not. Okay. What I propose is this: is um, it seemed like people were able to have a more robust interaction um, in the small groups. I think a group, a fifty-person Zoom, is pretty pretty challenging. And um, so, why don't we do this, Ching Pei? You and I can work with our. Uh, principals, our instructional leaders, um, we can work with the cabinet team, we can um, collect this feedback and um, see how it uh, influences our thinking regarding the models that we've presented. Um, you know, one of the comments that was made in the secondary group, uh, the secondary education group was, you know, people may have responded to distance learning via the survey, based on their experience with distance learning to date. And, and as we look ahead, we would hope that the district would provide stronger support to teachers for distance learning and we could learn from experience. Teachers could share resources and best practices. We could do more training and um, we might have a better distance learning program. And you know, d high quality distance learning every day may be better than um, a very strained um, every other day uh, type of program where you take a, a subject for a quarter and then you have a quarter off and then you take a subject for a quarter. So um, folks very much weighing the pros and cons of the different models. And I think, you know, as we get, you know, as we make sense of this survey data and we take the, the feedback that's been given via these small groups, Maybe we can spend a little bit of time as a whole group on Monday, maybe a half hour, and then we go into small groups again, um, if only to have more productive conversation and um, more of a dialogue back and forth with the participants here so we can take advantage of all the brain power we have on this um, committee. Um, does that, uh, can I see a show of hands? I mean, will that work for most people with a short, whole group and then we break out into the small groups uh, next um, next Monday. Okay, um, I really appreciate everyone's time. If you think of anything in the interim, um, you're welcome to send me an email, uh, email uh, Ching Pei, Pam, um, and me. And also if you'd like to have a conversation, I'm more than happy to talk with folks on the phone and explore uh, issues or alternative thinking in more detail because um, I do recognize the limits of these big Zoom meetings. So, um, Michael? Yeah. Uh, we do have a few minutes left and there's a few hands raised. Oh, okay. I thought I uh, checked with you. Um, go ahead. Um, Aura Grinberg? Yes, hi. So, I was wondering if there has an, an if we have any visibility at this point, um, since we last talked about what footsteps or other childcare programs are planning, as we're discussing the various models, do we know where kids are going to go? Will there be a place for them during the off weeks? I mean, that like, likely kind of follows on what Anne was saying earlier that, you know, 
will our kids be in that consistent cohort when they're in school and off school and maybe footsteps, or will they all be going home to various other childcare programs, all being with other 15 kids, um, give or take, some of them might be even 20 kids or more. Do we have any sense of that, of what's being planned? Genevieve? Um, in the child care group, uh, the child care providers, and I'm going to ask the three of you to speak about your concern, which was, it depends on the model, if we go a bubble group or not. And that's where I'll have, um, Karen, are you available to bring up the concerns for the child care group? I'd be happy to. Uh, Maybe we'll give, uh, Adila some time to talk as well. Yep, absolutely, because we're all in this together. Yeah, um, Aaron, Adila, and Talisha. Yes, we're definitely. Um, we don't have the answers yet about what we're going to look like till we know what the model is, but I highly recommend a cohort model and not a bubble model. Bubble model where it's just one classroom, one teacher, and nobody can break the bubble, basically. I would like to see a whole a group of kids, like all the kindergartners and first graders, um, and this was suggested by um, Nancy McGee. Uh, it will give us a lot more flexibility for childcare. And um, there's a lot of, none of the uh, ways you're proposing are gonna make it really easy to do childcare, but we're looking outside the box and trying to figure it out. You asked about full day care. Footsteps has Barrett Community Center um, that we're partners with the city of Belmont. We could do full day care, at least 10, I'd say eight classrooms there. Um, but we're only allowed to have the amount of kids that, that you're allowed to. So 12, 15, depending on what the health department says. So we do, we are fortunate to have that option, um, but we're going to, all the child care are going to need a lot more space on the school campus um, to be able to do our programs because we can only serve very small classrooms. When we're serving 40 kids, we can serve 12 right now. So I'll let the other providers speak. Um, I guess want to definitely echo what she just said. For us at Sandpiper, space will become an issue. We will need to expand into classrooms um and um other spaces um so for us to expand our program but again if we, i believe if we stay in the bubble that will be challenging um so we would definitely need to have the stable cohort for us to work and to provide services to more kids because right now the way it's set up is if that classroom child if that classroom has 12 and only four of those kids come to our child care we have to have one staff with four kids and that don't work for us. That just. <laughs> <laughs> so unless you want everybody paying, you know, four times, you know, four times as much. Yeah. Yeah. And she right. forgot to say we would need two teachers for those four kids. Yes. If yes. Sick, we'd have to have a, a backup. So yes. that, it's even worse business model. Yeah. Yes. Or Talisha will be everywhere. <laughs> um, okay. Well, we understand. Um, yeah, there's no expectation that uh, um, we keep the groups together in bubble cohorts for the after school program, but I think we'd want to come to agreement on how many groups of 12 or 15 we were willing to combine um, uh, in order to preserve safety. Pam, uh, next comment. April Northrup. Hi, April. Hi, thank you. Um, so um, just a couple of things. One is just logistics uh, logistics for these meetings. Um, I had a couple of uh, friends uh, texting me at the beginning of this saying, um, where's the Zoom link? And th thank you, Michael, for answering in the chat. And thank you, Jerome. Um, so I think, um, you know, everybody who's here, we're fortunate to be able to give our opinions. Um, I think there are other people who would like to give their opinions as well. And I understand that we can't expand this group, um, but I would suggest that we do in the future um, provide a live stream for the large group section um, so that other people can feel involved. And then also, I just wanted to ask, um, what will be like the format for the town hall tomorrow? The format will be um, a real quick overview of um, our current thinking, the surveys, um, and then uh, uh, some of the feedback that we've heard from this committee, and then um, uh, basically opening it up to a fair amount of Q&A from the group. So it's gonna be, um, hopefully, well, 
it's going to be more listening than talking, and we're just trying to uh, find, find some alternative ways in which we can engage the community. Um, and yeah, we take your point with regard to uh, the, uh, these meetings being public. So we were going to share the recording of the, the uh, whole group uh, part of this meeting, but um, we realized that you know, maybe um, a live feed uh, or both a live feed and a recording for the whole group portion um, is a better way to go. So Pam, Jerome, and I can, can work on that and we appreciate the feedback. Uh, Pam, Thank you. Any, any more comments? Uh, Michelle Green. Hey, Michelle. Yeah, hi. Um, so we'll probably all be mulling this over and trying to find the perfect solution over the next few days. I Good. thought, <laughs> yeah, right. Um, I thought one thing that uh, we didn't talk about that Ching Pei that came out of element, the elementary ed one that is a different option that as a few of us thought was important to, to um, delve into is the idea that there are different developmental needs. Um, you've considered the, we've considered the K-5 as one developmental need and the middle school, but that it might be um, from safety and educational viewpoint that the best uh, option is that the young kids, either K-1 or K-2 and, and TK, might have a different schedule that meets their needs um, developmentally. We're, we're, te we're teaching the kids how to read and how to write, and it's just a, a lot different than the upper grades. And so there could be two models within a K-5. Understood and, and, and agreed. And so we would uh, welcome the thinking of our primary teachers and parents. You know, the folks K-1 or K-2 is typically how we, we think about it. Um, yeah, we'd welcome a uh, modified approach uh, for sure. We don't, yeah, we're not, we have an interest in simplicity, uh, but not to the point where one size fits all, right? So there's, you know, teaching is going to be hard enough, the communication and, and all the testing and the temperature taking and, and how we do lunch and the, how we do recess and how you know, the pickups and the staggered schedules, all that's gonna be complicated enough. Um, so we do wanna to try to keep things simple, but that being said, we're, we gotta be student-centered. And so folks have talked about equity, folks have talked about developmental needs, and, and we, we truly invite your input there. Pam, uh, next comment. Uh, no, no other comments. Oh, yeah. yeah, sorry. Diane Sexton? Sure, hi, Diane. Hi, finally learned how to use the hand raise. Okay, uh, please remember TK. Okay, it gets kind of left off of this model. So it's just a few of us in TK, but we want to be re remembered, please. <laughs> of course, of course. So um, we appreciate uh, the reminder and absolutely, you know, for now, um, we have in mind a, uh, a similar school day but um, we obviously need to, uh, as, as Michelle mentioned, pay attention almost grade level by grade level in terms of the needs and then also uh, making sure our teachers have planning time and making sure that we do the staggered schedules a little bit so that we don't have all 300 students at an elementary school coming on the exact same time in the exact same place so we can allow that social distancing. Pam, uh, additional comment? No, there's not. It's 5.57. Uh, Michelle, uh, that question, will daycare be able to use our large common areas like the multi-use room or library? Um, the answer is yes, as long as we're not using it programmatically during the day. Um, you know, if you have one group of people going in there um, during the day, you can't exactly uh, have it for then a different group of child care. So I think it really depends on um, you know, how we want to allocate those resources, um, uh, for sure. So, um, anyway, so for Monday, 4 p.m., we'll plan to start with at least, let's say, the first half hour as a whole group. We'll live stream and record. We will break out into small groups, and then we will keep after this, and folks are invited to 
um, chew on the data we've shared with you, um, ask us questions, give us your suggestions and, and things for consideration, and we'll keep after it. We really appreciate your time. Thank you all so much. Thank you.